So this is David Press. Uh, he's a well colleagues at the Point Reyes National Seashore since 1997. He earned his PA in biology at UC Santa Cruz. And MS in ecology at UC Davis justifies where he studied green algae and invertebrates in international school during the zero. So I've been, I've been a point race since 1997. I've actually been the wildlife ecologist for just the last couple of years. Um, I've worked on a, a variety of different uh, monitoring uh, programs at point race, uh, including the Northern Spotted Owl. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was, you know, we're, we're just back after a long weekend. Um, the topic is a little lighter today. Just want to give you an overview of the species and our approach to management of point rays, what we know about the species, and what some of our, our future directions for, for research on point rays. So, there'll be time for questions at the end, um, specifically about uh, you know, what the work we're doing with spotted owls, but you know, I don't know if any questions about what we're doing on the point rays. Um, if I you know, flip my lines and leave you stumped, please just raise your hand and we'll get back on track. So I want to just give you a, a general overview of the natural history of the Northern Spotted Owl, um, our current conservation status, which some of you may be aware of. I'll talk to you a little bit about our man management approach uh, within, within the National Park Service and introduce you to our monitoring program. I can give you a general overview of what we've learned so far in terms of our monitoring efforts. And then want to go to a little bit of detail about uh, the barred owl. Uh, special recently arrived in the Grand County and are uh, cousins of the, uh, of the Northern Spotted Owl, also the same <coughs> genus of strips. The Spotted Owl uh, is represented by three separate subspecies, uh, the Northern Spotted Owl, speaking of today, the California Spotted Owl, and the Mexican Spotted Owl. The range of the Northern Spotted Owl extends uh, from British Columbia south to Marin County. Uh, DNA work, mitochondrial DNA work that has been completed on owls in the Santa Cruz Mountains and further south, identify the split being right at San Francisco Bay between California and the Northern Spotted Owl. Uh, presumably there's some dispersal issues coming up around the very well developed Bay Area and the very large San Francisco Bay and Delta regions. The owl is a, it's a medium sized owl. And a, well, very large football uh, size owl. Uh, you can see the dark spotting, um, or light spotting, and, and kind of a, a pine cone look to the owl. With very uh, deep dark eyes. Uh, these these features are, are really key if you do see an owl in the, in the field to, to pay attention to to help distinguish the species. Uh, the great horned owl, for example, has yellow eyes. The, the chest is always very important to give a look at. The barred owl. You're looking at a barred owl from behind, it look just like a spotted owl. But you'll get that bar and then the picture coming up. Um, the bar on the chest of the of bark. We sex the male and the female uh, spotted owl through the vocalizations. The typical four note call of a male spotted owl is a lower pitch than the female. Otherwise, um, they're indistinguishable. They're, they're really the same size and the same pattern. Um, they have a long lifespan. They are primarily nocturnal. Um, they roost during the day um, on open limbs, so they are easy to observe if you know where to look. It's not as if they duck into a cavity for the end of the day, completely out of sight um, from the eye. They're non-migratory, so the, the, you know, the, the owls have a point raised. They're residents year-round. And they have, you know, very relatively small for point raising or for the for the, the range, relatively small home ranges within point rays. And they generally remain within a certain area, uh, within a certain drainage uh, during the entire year. They do generally make for life. Um, there's always exceptions to that. We, we, through some of the banding work we've done, we have seen some some movement of banded owls between different locations. But owls that we banded up to. 12 years ago, have uh, remained within the same home range, within the same site uh, since then. Uh, breeding is generally uh, fairly broad. 
In terms of prey, uh, plug rays anyhow, about 90% of their diet uh, has to go to dusty the wood rat. Uh, you can see uh, this uh, wood rat nest here, a uh, pile of uh, dead twigs and sticks that are pulled together by the, by the rats. Uh, but, you know, they will uh, prey on a, a variety of other species. Further to the north of us, uh, northern flying squirrels, uh, uh, tree voles are quite common, but those species don't exist. So in terms of conservation status, uh, the species was listed uh, as threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service back in June of 1990. The, the, uh, the, the, the listing was primarily a result of habitat loss through the forest industry. Uh, but in recent years, the range expansion of barred owls has been identified, and there's the barred owl there now, the lower part of the screen has been identified as a significant threat to the persistence of the northern spotted owl. Work that was published in 2005, which pulled together the results of water programs uh, across the range, including in Murray County, documented a, a, almost a 4% annual, annual population decline in the northern spotted owl. So just to the north of us here, um, starting essentially at the slopes of uh, Mount Tamalpais, we get into some very, very nice prime northern spot of Mount Tam. Uh, looking north from Mount Tam, all these, this, this forested country, clear up you know, along the shore of Tamales Bay, is, provides just ideal wooded habitat for the northern spot of Mount. Each one of these red dots represents a known uh, spot of Mount territory. Most of the owl sites that we are aware of are on protected land, either uh, National Park Service, Point Reyes in Green, uh, Gold, and Golden Gate National Recreation Area down here, also in Green, uh, California State Park Land, uh, Marin Municipal Water District, and Yellow represents North County Open Space District. So there are, there are a lot of private plants that we actually have not surveyed. So we know there are more pairs out there uh, with, within the, within the area. But despite all this, you know, this this land protection, there are still some perceived threats to the persistence of northern spot owls. You may have, um, know quite a bit about sudden oak death. Um, we're, we're very concerned about the, you know, the, the impact of sudden oak death on northern spot owls. Uh, we go into some of these sites that we've been going to prior to when SOD arrived on the site, and we've seen significant. Uh, changes to the, the canopy density, um, and we're wondering also about uh, this, the consequential impacts to the wood rats, since the wood rats are, are feeding quite, quite a lot on the acorns that are coming off of the, uh, of the canopies. We also do have barred owls in Murray County. Um, work that was done in 2005 identified genetic isolation with our northern spotted owls, so there was, there was not flow of the species between Moray County and further north into Sonoma <coughs> County. Uh, of course, in, in a lot of a lot of areas, suppression of fire, you know, is, is a concern to land managers. Suppression of fire increased the intensity of the fire when the fire does actually uh, come through. And we saw that in 1995 with the Mount Vision fire in Point Reyes, where certain areas burned very hot. Considerable amount of time, and really just you know destroyed the forest, and it's really starting from the ground up. So we, we do perceive that as a significant risk, and, and, and possibly recreational pressure. We we have a, a very dense network of roads and trails uh, in Point Reyes, Golden Gate, and the rest of Marin County, and there's always concern about you know visitors um, uh, you know, encountering a spotted owl pair, nesting spotted owl pair. Uh, whether or not that's a, a population level threat versus a, a, you know, a threat to the individual um, remains the same. So for us, having northern spotted owls within the National Park Service and has significant management implications. And it really drives everything we do within the forested habitats of, of the National Park Service in the But with the, you know, the expectation, of course, with the listing and you know, with Fish and Wildlife Service is that we will do everything we can to protect the critical habitat of the northern spotted owl. The goal we have 
essentially zero net loss to the habitat that we manage. We, we need to be able to min minimize the disturbance to spotted owls. We have trails and roads that uh, require our attention to be maintained on a regular basis. But we need to go, uh, do those activities without disturbing nests to spotted owls at this present. Uh, for some of the, the larger projects that we embark on within the, the park, consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, can be at times required uh, in order to, to justify the work that we're doing and to show the Fish and Wildlife Service that we're, we're taking into consideration the way we spot out of the work and we're doing everything we can to minimize the impact. We place uh, noise restrictions um, during the breeding season on work that occurs within our forest habitats. So in the event that we identify a nest represented by the star there, we place a 500 foot uh, no cut zone around that nest tree. And that no cut zone is uh, expected to um, remain in place uh, beyond the breeding season. Uh, we, we, we understand that these the spotted owls remain close to their, their home range uh, areas. And you know all of that structure whatever wood rat nests may be present, are really uh, vital to ensuring that northern spotted owls can remain in place and thrive in a particular location. We put a quarter mile uh, noise buffer around any nest trees so that you know, during that nesting season, the owls aren't disturbed by the running of chainsaws to the trees or um, a host of other you know, noise disturbance possibilities. So our our, our team, our spot owl team, works very closely with our, our roads and our trails folks and our other maintenance folks during the course of the breeding season. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of work that needs to be done during the breeding season to improve the next when vegetation is growing really um, at its best. Uh, trails can close in very quickly if they're not properly So areas need to be cleared for spotted owls before we allow our trails to really go through to maintain those trails. So a lot of the surveys that we're doing out there are strictly for uh, you know, management needs to make sure that the work that we're doing is not impacting the spot at all. Our crews can also just wait until after the nesting season to, to do their work, in which case there is no concern about disturbing the spot at all. Or they can use alternative methods to getting the work done. And our, our trails crew has always been uh, very enthusiastic about that. Here they are using a, a large cross-cut saw rather than a chainsaw to clear the trail. They've also used, um, uh, rather than uh, using a uh, weed whacker, they'll use a scythe uh, to knock down uh, some of the softer vegetation on the steam pit. So it's, a, it's been a, a really great uh, collaboration with that team uh, to protect the small owls and the park service. But we, we don't just monitor northern spotted owls. For management purposes, um, we've been we've been doing it since 1997, and partly that's because we just we have the obligation as a federal agency to be knowledgeable about uh, threat species that occurs within our boundaries. It does guide our internal operations, as I, as I just described, but it also provides us the opportunity to identify any um, significant events or threats to the population that may, down the road, require some management attention uh, from our state. We, we first started looking at northern spot owl presence in 93, and then in 1997-98, we conducted a, a very thorough inventory of the public lands within, within the Rick County. Uh, that was in collaboration with uh, the Rick Water District, the open space folks out of the county, and particularly with the PRB of conservation science. Uh, following that inventory, we monitored annually about 50 known uh, sites. Uh, we really at the time, and we've increased that since then. Um, in around 2006, we needed to pull the program in a little bit tighter and, and started developing a protocol that was just applicable to our MPS plans. Uh, that was predominantly because we had different study objectives from what was going on at MMWD and with the open space. Those folks are really primarily interested in, in management, whether or not what they're doing is going to be impacting their owls. And 
we had a, we have broader questions about the existence of the species within the park. So we kind of needed to take a step back and, and take a take a, a hard look at our sample design and to determine whether or not we were had a design that could really look at the data that we had in a statistically robust way to like identify you know, changes in the population, trends in the population. Uh, in fact, Ed and, and Gretchen helped us with some of that work uh, uh, seven years ago. Eventually, we had, ended up publishing our, our protocol. Uh, it was a peer-reviewed protocol that we published through the National Park Service and as part of the inventory and monitoring program. The inventory and monitoring program is sort of an arm of the National Park Service just focused on doing this kind of work. Uh, Point Reyes, our Harbor Seal Monitoring Program is also part of the, uh, the IM program. We look at plant community change. Our Coho Steelhead um, work is also happening out of the IM program. So the idea is that the, the, this provides you know, the, the scientists the opportunity to really focus on the monitoring work that they're doing and not getting bogged down in day to day management. Which, uh, rest assured, really does bog you down. Um, and the idea is that these INM programs are, are there to sort of perform part of the management. So what, we, what we're shifting over to is a sample design, this is this panel design, where every year we'll be visiting the, a fixed set of 28 sites, randomly select those 28 sites, and then monitor those every year. And then in subsequent years, or we, we have an additional group of eight sites, and then another eight, and then another eight that we monitor. So a total of 36 sites that are visited every year. And during the course of a, a four-year uh, time span, we'll have actually visited every known owl territory within the National Park Service boundaries. And what we're looking at are changes in occupancy. Uh, we're looking at changes in reproductive success. And we're looking at the nest site characteristics. Uh, our methods are based off of uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, survey protocol, uh, but then we've sort of adopted some of those survey methods, or tweaked some of those survey methods a little bit for, uh, for Marine County. Um, our, our methods, without going into too much detail, our goal was to really have less impact on northern spotted owls in, in the course of doing a monitor work uh, to, 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 to answer these questions. So in terms of occupancy, occupancy is that's where we're trying to determine what the pair bond is at that particular site for that particular year. Uh, they're more or less solitary in the winter. Um, again, they're not ranging outside of their, their, their territory, which is more or less in red bounded by, by watershed boundaries. Um, but then they'll pair up in the uh, late February. And for us, uh, our breeding season or monitoring season starts March 1st. There, and as I, as I did mention before, there's a high degree of site, de site fidelity, and, and we've been able to document that through some of our band work that we've done. So in terms of how we get this done, uh, there's, there's this thought that we're out there just wandering around at night, listening for owls, trying to figure out where these guys are. Uh, in fact, I haven't done any night work in a number of years. We, we know these owls, at this point, we know these owls so well, you know, we know 10 years of nest tree um, uh, locations that usually we just start by walking into a site uh, during the day and we look for this, look for sign. We look for pellets on the ground. We look for whitewash, which is their poop. Uh, these owls, they'll tend to prefer to roost in the same trees day after day after day. Uh, after a while, a considerable amount of whitewash will develop under that, under that tree. So sometimes you you're actually just looking at the ground as you walk into the site, looking for that white wash. Sometimes you look up and, and there's the air. On occasion, we do a uh, call for the owls. Um, when they, the, the, the owls mobilize to sort of defend their territories. So we go out there, we, uh, we use a digital calling device. Uh, we play a, a four note male call. You'll often will get a call back, uh, especially during the previous season when they defend their territories. And they will call during the day. So we'll sometimes just wander around for a while, they'll you know, find the owls, we'll call, and then they'll essentially lead us right, right to them. If we are having difficulty during discovering where the owls are during the day, 
that's when we'll go out at night. They're far more responsive at night. Uh, you, if they have shifted over, even if it's just a little bit uh, away from some of the historic areas that they use, it, it's very difficult to find them. So you don't use that kind of thing. So then we get out at night, play uh, calls from a couple different points, get compass bearings, and triangulate on where that owl is calling from, you put it in GIS, and theoretically you just walk right into the site. So after we determine occupancy, we were determined, interested in looking at nesting status. Um, so generally they're using platform nests. Uh, that's quite different from further to the north of us, where they uh, mostly use the cavity nests, uh, just these natural holes up in the trees, especially older trees. Uh, down here, Douglas fir and redwood uh, are most commonly used. It, it, it can be difficult to find these nests. We're fortunate that most of these, uh, most of our birds are nesting in platforms. You know, there, there are not a lot of structures like this in the woods. Um, they actually, they don't build their own nests. They reuse nests that have been built by um, other raptors, uh, squirrel nests sometimes, or they just use uh, a, a natural accumulation of material that's been deposited in you know, the form of a tree or whatnot. So and we're fortunate in terms of using these platform nests because we can just we can wander around the site and look at every one of these potential structures until we find the owl. Can't really do that with a cavity nest. That's the issue. Can't see any of those cavities. On occasion, we will use uh, mice to find the owl. Uh, the owl nest. Get a, get a lab mouse or a feeder mouse from uh, Petco. Put the put the mouse out. The owl catches the mouse. And Brings it back to the nest. It's the female that incubates the eggs and stays on the nest year round. But part of what I was saying before about um, our, our methods at Marin being tweaked a little bit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service protocol to reduce the impact of the owl. Part of that is, is about mousing. We need to mouse as, as little as, as, as possible. Whereas the established protocols are, are a very heavy on this device. So after we've discovered uh, or determined nesting status, if they are nesting that particular year, we'll, we'll follow you know, the success of the nest until the young are fledged. Um, they, they, they grow quite quickly. You can see that these guys are about the size of an adult, an adult owl at this point. And this is just before fledgling, um, you know, just after a little over a month from, from hatching. Uh, one, two fledglings is, is common. Uh, we've had three on one occasion uh, in the park. Uh, interesting, three is three is more common um, on sort of the urban interface in Marin. Um, communities uh, around Mill Valley and Ross uh, have spotted owls up, you know, up on, you know, on the edges of town. It's far more common to see three fledglings coming from, from nests closer to these urban areas. I assume that there's something to do with the prey availability of uh, those group settings. And what we're primarily interested in looking at in terms of the uh, persistence of the population is, is getting an idea of fecundity. And fecundity, we define as the number of female young produced per territorial. So when we're looking at our data uh, and determining what our fecundity value is for that particular year, we're also considering the the non-nested pairs, uh, we have territorial females, we have a, a pair, so even, even if they're not nesting. And we also take into consideration sites where we just have a single female that's territorial over that site. And we, we pull that information in to establish the fecundity of that particular So it's not just about being out there and counting the number of birds that actually come off the nest. The number of birds that are not produced is, is equally as so, so far um, at this point within the area that we've worked, and, and this is in not just Park Service land, but it would include uh, MFWD, open space areas, um, about 90 known territories. It's actually the highest density of the northern spotted owl documented within this range. Uh, we have relatively high fecundity compared to uh, some of the other monitoring. Interestingly, in 2007, well, we documented our first breed, non-breeding year uh, within our um, Park Service lands on a single nest. Um, and 
It's actually more common to see that further north, where you actually have these good year, bad year uh, sort, of, uh, sort of patterns. Um, presumably something related to the prey base, you know, with just one data point there, it's hard for us to kind of go back in time and figure out what, what, what might have caused that. Again, we usually do see them nesting mostly in the conifer, conifer platform nests. But in Marin, we see a broader habitat use than uh, really than what we expected. Uh, it seemed like everywhere we went looking for owls, we would find them. And including, um, you, you know, here we have our your typical redwood forest and typical Douglas fir forest, but then we also get them in this sort of hardwood forest that are dominated by oak, uh, bay, laurel. And, you know, once in a while you, you'll get, um, you'll get owls that are nesting in, ha in habitats like this without a single conifer wrap, which is you know, really very different from what you see uh, further to the north of us. In terms of our occupancy data, our, uh, our the black bar, uh, the black area of the bar represents a uh, pair of owls in that particular year, uh, a percentage on the, uh, on the axis there. So we have a very high percentage of, of pairs uh, within our, our sites in Marin County. Um, fecundity, um, I, I you know, have to think of going compare it against with some of the other sites, but again, I said it's relatively high compared to some of the other sites um, within the range. The last couple of years, um, we've had uh, lower fecundity than uh, previously. We're suspecting that, and we haven't really done a proper analysis, but we suspect that some of the later uh, spring storm conditions that we experienced in the last couple of years may have attributed to uh, the, the lower fecundity. Uh, the late, late nesters, or the late, these late storms can result in nest failures uh, for other storm levels. Now compare this to um, our friends to the north at Olympic National. Uh, again, black bar representing a uh, uh, pair at these sites. And I think, I think we can all see it. There's a, a, a very, very sharp decline um, over the last you know, 20 years of monitoring the pair occupancy. So the barred owl was first observed at Olympic National Park in 1985. And uh, in recent years, with about 52 sites monitored every year, barred owls are detected approximately 85% of all northern spotted owl territories in the National Park area. So the barred owl is a, so it's been called a range expanded species. Um, again, it's the same genus, Strix. Uh, it's larger, uh, but definitely more aggressive. Uh, and the, Fish and Wildlife Service in 2011 and the revised recovery for the northern spotted owl described that competition for the barred owl poses a significant and complex threat to the spotted owl. Um, the work of Lively in 2009 uh, pulled together over 12,000 records of barred owl, um, trying to patch together essentially the, the expansion of the species. Um, from its you know, native native habitat uh, to the east of us, and essentially identify these two two corridors um, through which the, the barred owl has has expanded its range, and then as it as it came into the northwest and and then traveled down the, the Pacific coast and got into Marin County in uh, in 2002. Now the I think everyone that has looked at this is a general consensus that this range expansion has been the result of human activity, uh, particularly that in some of these uh, really important uh, corridors for the barred owl, there's actually been an increase in forest cover. An increase in forest cover, and, and we're, we're, talk, we're, you know, we're, going, we're going pretty far back here, right? 1873, some of these early records for range expansion. So we're really talking about kind of development of, of the West, um, you know, in, in, in the latter part of the century. And, you know, what, what had happened at that point, we had uh, loss of uh, some major grazing species, virtual extermination of bison, uh, 
major changes to fire regimes, uh, less fire. And then, of course, you know, planting of trees, development of urban areas. And so that's all those sort of uh, pieces have, have allowed that barred owl to, to move across and then south uh, as far as the way on the city coast of the uh, Work by, done by David Williams out of Oregon State University. It was published uh, just earlier this year. I think really does a really great job of sort of summing up what's going on in terms of barred owls versus spotted owls in the range. So it is a 745 square kilometer study, a huge study. 82 barred owl territories identified, only 15 of those barred owl territories. The barred owl, uh, the spotted owl territories are, are larger than barred owl territories such that at times there were several barred owl territories existing in one spotted owl territory. There's a significant dietary overlap, uh, but the barred owl diet is, is more diverse. We found uh, that annual survival was lower in uh, spotted owls than in barred owls. So barred owls are just, you know, surviving uh, in, uh, in better ways than the spotted owl are. And, um, and the barred owls are producing six times more young over a three year period than the spotted owls. So overall, a very dominant species. Uh, we, we, been seeing some similar patterns uh, in Marin County. We, we published this um, in Western Birds uh, just last year, just sort of summing up what we know so far about barred owls in Marin County. Uh, and currently, we're at very low numbers. Uh, we only have three known residents, one of which is a nesting pair within uh, right in the heart of the woods. We, as with other areas, we've observed aggressive interactions between barred owls and spotted owls, literal and physical confrontation. Um, in a lot of areas um, at the bottom here, we, we see nest failures in the presence of barred owls, well-established spotted owl nests, barred owl on site, and subsequent nest failure. And we, we certainly see a more diverse diet within the barred owls. Um, visitors to the woods are, are fascinated to watch the barred owls actually fishing with the red crew, fishing crayfish out of the uh, in 2007, when we had a non-nesting year for spotted owls, the barred owls nested uh, just the five. Uh, so uh, that may be a, a partially due to the diversity in their diet allowed them to shift prey species from whatever they have impacted with the spotted owl in that particular year. That's just a hypothesis. So this early invasion in Marin actually provides some great research opportunities. Uh, for us. Uh, and we've embarked on a, a radio telemetry program. Uh, this is one of our, our barn owls uh, that we were able to capture earlier this year and get a, a radio device on that owl. So what we're hoping to do um, is we have two of our barn owls captured at this point. We have hope to get the rest of them captured. What we're hoping to do is just get a, a better understanding of the home range size of the barn owl, uh, get a better documentation of the impact uh, on barred owl to the spotted owl territories closest to where barred owls are. And we, we're also hoping to, to use uh, the radio telemetry to confirm that, the, essentially confirm the number of barred owls that we have. This, the, the pair at your woods, um, they have a very small home range size, but some of the other barred owls, we're finding that uh, they're covering very large areas. Uh, traveling between you know, five to six different northern spotted owl sites. And we presume this is the same barred owl that we're detecting at all these different sites, but without having the uh, radio tag or banded until now, we have no way of really confirming that. So it helps us kind of uh, pull in our, our, uh, the, the uncertainty uh, around that. Uh, we also have to get some of our spotted owls uh, radio tags, so we're uh, working on a, developing a project to, you know, look, to be able to look at you know, the interactions, the, the impact of the spotted owls in terms of the areas they're covering, their own range size, in the presence of spotted owls. I did want to just wrap up a little bit and just um, talk a little bit about recreational pressure. Um, certainly, the, there's a possibility uh, as you're out hiking in Marin seeing uh, spotted owls, uh, they, they have a tendency to 
mess or hang out with just the super popular hiking trails. Uh, it's always important to just, you know, be quiet around owls. Uh, you don't want to disturb them during the nesting season. You want to be very careful about leaving trash. It's, um, so preaching to the choir here, but uh, trash will sort of attract uh, coyotes or bobcats or whatever, and, and which are, you know, potentially impact uh, the, the owls. Um, you know, we don't want to be using flash photography. And if you see, if there's any indication that your presence is, is in any way alarming or disturbing the owls, the best thing to do is just uh, just walk away and appreciate the time. So uh, just in conclusion here, um, we're in Spotted Owls in Moran. We have a very high breeding density of broad habitat use. At this point, we have very low competition from barred owls as opposed to uh, the rest of their range. Despite you know, the land protection in Moran, there are certain conservation challenges that we do face. Uh, sudden oak death, I think, is a very interesting uh, issue that we don't feel like we've seen the impacts yet. but. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to look at what the possibilities are. Um, so the spotted owl presence does really guide our management actions within forested areas of the National Park Service and with the other uh, management agencies in the world. And we're hoping that through our monitoring program, we can really get a broader understanding of all the impacts to the north of the spotted owl space in the land. Climate, changes in vegetation, spotted owl, who knows? What's coming next? Uh, if you're interested, you can um, check out sfnps.org for more information. That's a great portal to a lot of the work that's happening, both um, at Point Reyes and Golden Gate. Our friends at Pinnacle established the south of us. That's a portal to sort of all the work that we're doing in terms of natural uh, resources and collections. Uh, Bill Merkel, a wildlife ecologist uh, across the Bay here, is a uh, partner on this project. Uh, a number of field technicians um, and early leaders in our monitoring program, Sarah Allen and Daphne Hatch of the Park Service, our friends at PRBO Conservation Science, uh, and fellow named Dennis Rock with the uh, National Council on Air and Stream Improvement. He's uh, spearheading on part of that work. And with that, Well, 
you have, you could stop. That's, I think that's the thing that you have to think about. Stop it, you can just get in there, get the work done, and then step away and let the spot valves thrive. Yeah. And then the part valves will just you know, continue to move in. So, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, 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 we're, we're, we've been working very hard um, to, to really emphasize the importance of the marine population to the wildlife service and some of the other big players. Uh, so much money has been pumped into this thing over the last few years of the spot of all conservation. And I think folks are finally realizing there's something pretty unique going on here uh, that merits the attention. Yeah. I was wondering how you came up with the um, distance for the noise buffers. I mean, I, I've yeah. looked at a lot of research and it's all over the place and very site-specific yeah. species. There, specific. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, essentially, that's just some blanket guidance we got from Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. And um, it works for us, and fortunately, folks that we work with haven't given, given us too much grief about it. There is a very comprehensive guide uh, put out by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, where they rate all sorts of different uh, tools and vehicles uh, that, that you might be using in spotted owl habitat, what the decibel level is, you know, as you, how that that sound level decreases with distance away from the source. Um, we fortunately haven't had to go to that level. And, you know, some of our guys kind of got interested in it. Look, you know, look my, I got my decibel meter. And, you know, my chainsaw is only making this much noise, and it's just so much easier to say, let's just do a quarter mile, call it good, and, and it's been working out fine. Well, I'm impressed you've been able to get that much of a buffer around it, so. Yeah, it's, well, it's, good. yeah it's, it's been a lot, it has been a lot of work. I mean, I think that um, a lot of land management agencies are, um, well, we used to do things differently, and, um, and it, you know, it's sort of like teaching them all about new tricks. When some of those old dogs retire, it makes it a little easier. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and I would say that I think it actually is, is um, it's probably just over, overdue. Uh, and really, once, a, once the owls uh, settle into their nesting site, uh, there's a, you know, they need a really pretty good reason to abandon that nest. So it's a lot of significant effort that's already gone into establishing that. But uh, you know, there are plants that are really like right that. Yes. Is there any interaction between the owls and ravens, and are you monitoring ravens? Yes, there, there, there is. Um, it's it's a lot more common in uh, the, the urban areas of East Marin, um, crows and ravens. So we are, and, and that's that's one thing that we really take into consideration in terms of our, our monitoring efforts and reducing our impact. Um, we, we really need to be aware of not making the presence of the owls known to the whole world. So when we call for owls, um, we often will have you know, stellar jays, ravens, crows coming in to, to find us or you know, figure out what's going on. Um, we often see those species Mobbing uh, more than spotted owls. It's, it's really quite common. Uh, so, yeah, we do keep track of what we see, and we don't have any uh, documented uh, nest failures due to, you know, that we, we could say for sure we could do the presence of ravens or crows or what have you. Uh, but, but again, in the east we're in, we see, we see the, the presence. Do you know if the raven population is stable <coughs> or increasing? Outer part of the peninsula, we do a lot of work with raven management, particularly in regards to uh, persistence of western stone plovers and uh, common bird, which is a, a seabird that, that nests out of offshore rocks and other ways. Out there, um, I think it, it, it's pretty well established that raven numbers are, are very, very highly inflated uh, due to ranching practices. And, you know, we can't Thank you. 
monitoring sites um, where we know we have nesting owls. We're also monitoring sites where we've had uh, owl detections, but we've never actually uh, determined a pair present or even a nest. Um, and the, the, the key thing about our, one of the key things about our protocol is, you know, at some point we felt like we had to put some boundaries on it. And so essentially what we're doing right now is just looking at trends in time within our, our sort of fixed number of sites. Um, now, in the event that we do see uh, a decline, let's say, I think the next step would be to start radiating outside of that study area to see if maybe we're missing something, that they're shifting to other areas. Um, based on the work that we've done, a lot of inventory work we've done, we feel confident right now in terms of our understanding of the general home range size um, and, and we understand you know, how these pairs are interacting with each other to the point where we feel like we can identify whether or not there's a possibility of another owl pair kind of snooping in in between the sites, I would say. And, and we've, we've covered that area, those, those sort of in-between areas pretty good. And we did pick up some new nests in 2006 that were some 